Christine and I'm one of the tutors with Chang and today I wanted to make a short video about lethal alleles basically going over what they are, why they're important, and the different types and how they differ. So first of all to start an allele is going to be any variation of a gene and as its name suggests lethal alleles are going to be alleles in which the ultimate phenotypic manifestation of this allele is going to be death of the organism. And this is going to be because um, these lethal alleles affect the function of an essential gene. So this gene is crucial to the organism's survival and it's not going to be able to survive unless it possesses a fully functioning copy of this gene. When we're talking about lethal alleles, there's three main types we're going to be primarily concerned with. That includes dominant lethal alleles, recessive lethal alleles, and finally conditional lethal alleles. I'm going to go over the three different types and how they differ. So to start, dominant lethal alleles are going to be lethal when an organism possesses only one copy of this allele. And they usually arise from mutation of a wild type allele, and they tend to be removed from the population in the same generation that they arise. And this is because um, these alleles are lethal when the organism only has one form of this allele. So usually these organisms are going to die before they reach sexual maturity, so these alleles generally kick in as embryonic lethal alleles, which affect the embryo before the organism is even born, or the organism is going to die shortly after birth, or at some point before sexual maturity. So these alleles don't tend to persist in the gene pool. However, there are some exceptions where these dominant lethal alleles affect an organism after sexual maturity, and in that specific case, and this organism is going to be able to reproduce and have offspring and pass on this dominant lethal allele. So an example of this is going to be Huntington's disease. So Huntington's disease generally afflicts humans after they're about 35 years old. So this means that people are able to have children and pass on this gene even though they have a dominant lethal allele. So Huntington's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder that's going to manifest itself through certain symptoms such as loss of muscle coordination, impairment of cognitive function, and you're going to have some behavioral symptoms. And people with this disease are going to die within 15 to 20 years after they start having the onset of symptoms. So the Punnett square is going to depict what happens when someone who has Huntington's disease has children with someone who's unafflicted. So generally people with Huntington's disease carry only one copy of this allele, so they're going to be heterozygous rather than homozygous dominant, since that's fairly rare. And when they have children with someone who is homozygous recessive, which is the wild type, what's going to happen, as we can see, is offspring with Huntington's disease are going to be indicated in red, and unafflicted offspring are going to be in black. And from the Punnett square, we can see that if someone with Huntington's disease as children, there's a 50% chance that their child is going to also have Huntington's disease. So from there, I want to talk about how dominant lethal alleles are going to differ from recessive lethal alleles. So in the case of a recessive lethal allele, the organism is going to need to have two copies of this allele for it to be lethal. So this brings up an interesting case where you're going to have heterozygous organisms that aren't going to die off, unlike those with the dominant lethal allele where the heterozygous condition is deadly. So you're going to have two different cases. So some heterozygotes are going to have no obvious phenotypic effect. And what this basically means that the heterozygotes are going to be indistinguishable from your homozygous dominant wild type. And in the other case, the heterozygotes are going to have a unique phenotype that's completely different from the homozygous dominant uh, wild type at the same time, they're not going to have the lethality you see present in the homozygous recessive condition. So an example of this is going to be a Guti coat coloration in mice. So actually, a Guti coat coloration was how researchers originally discovered the existence of lethal alleles. So what happened is these mice are generally a Guti colored, which means they have this two-tone coloration of their fur, and that's going to be your homozygous dominant wild type. However, researchers also noted that there were certain mice exhibited yellow coat coloration. These were the heterozygotes. 
And when they crossed two heterozygotes, so basically two yellow mice, generally according to classical Mendelian genetics, they would expect to observe a 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio. So basically they would expect to see three organisms expressing the wild type versus one organism express, expressing the recessive condition. However, this is not what they saw. Instead, they saw a 2 to 1 phenotypic ratio of two yellow colored mice to one agouti colored mice whenever they crossed, did a monohybrid cross with two heterozygotes. So from this, they were able to conclude that this was occurring because the recessive homozygous condition was lethal. So one-fourth of all these organisms were dying off, which is why you observed a 2 to 1 phenotypic ratio that was not expected. Okay, so from there, I'm going to talk a little bit about conditional lethal alleles. So conditional lethal alleles are unique in that they're not lethal unless they're triggered by some factor in the environment. So organisms with this lethal allele aren't going to manifest any symptoms unless there's that specific trigger in the environment that causes it to kick in. So there's two types of conditions. There's going to be permissive and non-permissive environmental conditions. So with a permissive environmental condition, this is the everyday, day-to-day -day conditions that aren't going to have any obvious effect on the lethal allele. The non-permissive condition is going to be that specific environmental trigger that's going to bring about lethality. So an example of this is going to be favism in humans. So humans who have favism are deficient in a specific enzyme known as glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. What happens is normally the permissive condition, these organisms are able to con consume food normally and they're able to function as anyone else would. However, for people with favism in the non-permissive condition, which is per consumption of fava beans, they're going to have this um, lethal allele kick in. So what basically happens is they experience hemolytic anemia. So their blood cells are going to start breaking down and they start to clog up the blood vessels and this ultimately results in kidney failure and then death. So favism, however, is kind of unique in the case that people who have favism are more resistant to malaria, which is one of the reasons why this specific disease is able to persist because it confers resistance to another disease. So hopefully that clears up a little bit about what lethal alleles are and the three different types and how they differ.